Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Sam Bass. I'm with the Market Intelligence Team here at Open Minds. And today, as part of our weekly private roundtable series, we have Open Minds Vice President Emily Corns and Executive Vice President John Seymour. And they'll be discussing how to build, develop, and evaluate your marketing plan. Emily brings nearly 20 years of healthcare marketing and communications experience to Open Minds. Having started her career as a program manager for Allegheny County Health Department, where she developed and delivered behavior change and education programs, Ms. Corns brings a similar focus of population health, wellness, and nutrition expertise to Open Minds. John Seymour has a wealth of experience in strategy, development, M&A, as well as marketing and healthcare, consumer packaged goods, and for-profit education industries. Mr. Seymour has deep experience in market assessment, development, and new product launches. Now, before we get started today, we have a couple of brief housekeeping reminders. First, while you are muted during today's briefing, we are interested in any questions that you may have. Please feel free to submit those in the question box, and Emily and John will have time at the end to answer them. And secondly, just as a Quick reminder, the PowerPoint slides and recording from today's briefing will be available tomorrow on the Open Minds website. And without further ado, I'll leave you with John and Emily. Thank you, Sam. Hi, John. Good to see you virtually today. Yes, um, good to see you, Emily. <laughs> John and I had the opportunity to meet each other for the first time in our Gettysburg office uh, not too long ago. Um, and we're really delighted to, um, to welcome John to Open Minds. And I'm very happy to be here with everybody today uh, to talk about one of my favorite things, which is marketing planning and marketing strategy. And today we have, uh, uh, we could spend hours talking about marketing planning and we do in our marketing uh, planning seminar. But today we have, just a little bit of time and what John and I really wanted to focus in on today is really talking about how you build uh, how you build new business and drive competitive advantage through your through your marketing strategy. So that's the lens we want to focus on. Um, we have a follow up uh, seminar coming up in about a month that's more focused on on virtual. Um, and uh, so we're, we're happy to be here and, and share um, some of our experience and um, some tools and resources that are available to you as elite members through Open Minds. Um, consider this the the cliff notes, if you will, of our uh, of our marketing strategy seminar. But I always like to level set and and set the stage in terms of um, what we are thinking about when we're talking about marketing. So I want you to take a look at this slide. I'm going to give you uh, a, a second or a few seconds to to read it and um, and interpret it for yourselves. Now I have uh, I have a bias where I think that when we use the term marketing, um, that people are, end up focusing on number three. So they really focus on the promotion and the selling and the distribution of products and services because that's the very visible kind of tip of the iceberg, uh, if you will, whenever it comes to, to marketing. And what we try to convey as part of our marketing planning education at Open Minds is that, again, that is the tip of the iceberg. It actually starts much, much deeper uh, than that. So you can't you can't have number three if you don't have number one and two. So, uh, you know, to us, marketing is really about getting um, the revenue that your organization needs to meet its mission. So the business activities that are involved in that process and directing your services from the provider to the customer. Um, marketing is really the business function that's responsible for organization revenue. And it's about understanding the need the needs of your customers and developing a service that meets those needs at a price that is affordable um, or that meets uh, uh, that's an acceptable uh, cost. So if you jump to number three without thinking about number one and two, you're going to find yourself either promoting a service that erodes your margin or um, promoting a service that your customers don't need or, or don't value. Sometimes I like to tell the story um, about the one ton dump truck. So what you didn't hear in Sam's bio um, uh, is that I was at, at one point the vice president of uh, marketing and communication for a, uh, a company that manufactures dump bodies. 
Uh, and I don't include that on my resume because I, although it was a terrific experience um, and, and one that um, I really, really value, it was my family business and my boss was my dad. Uh, and in that role, uh, my uh, we, we manufactured what we called the it was called a one ton dump truck, and my dad loved this truck. It was really really um, uh, wonderful. And when he brought me, he he felt like it was the best product that we had. And when he brought me on board as the vice president of marketing, he was very focused on number three, about promoting and selling and distributing um, this one ton dump truck. Whenever, uh, as you know, having come from a marketing background and in um, consumer products world, I, I, you know, stopped my boss and said, I think that we need to do a little bit of analysis um, into these different products and services that we're offering just to make sure that, um, that this makes sense, to put this much promotional effort into this particular product. And what we found was that the one time dunk Every time we produced one of these dump trucks, um, we were actually losing money every time, several thousand dollars. So that's the kind of exercise that, that um, you as a marketer in your organization need to, uh, to take on. So it's not just about promoting and selling and distributing. It's making sure that you are um, providing the right services that um, meet the, the organizational objectives and your consumers' needs. So my little dump truck stories. And again, just level setting, we won't spend a lot of time here. You've probably all seen or um, are familiar with Peter Drucker's five questions. So um, in your role in marketing for your organization, uh, it's important to ask yourself these questions. What is our mission? Who is our customer? What does that customer value? Um, and um, what does that customer value? And um, what are the results that you're looking for out of your marketing plan? And then in turn, what is in that plan? And those five questions actually provide the whole framework um, for your marketing plan. So we, we start our marketing uh, plan with the, the strategy for the organization. So for provider organizations, especially if you are working to compete and working to build new business, um, the strategy is generally focused on one of these options. Um, forgive me, I lost my, oops, sorry. Uh, one of these options. So you're developing new service lines or uh, you're acquiring new contracts or payer sources you might be looking at you might be looking at um, increasing service line volume, the the revenue that you're getting from certain service lines um, through volume or rate changes, or just increasing um, uh, the um, those services that are available. You might be merging with other partners or providers or creating new affiliations. Perhaps you're acquiring other providers. Um, and there are a lot of other options as well uh, on how you might uh, approach, uh, approach the market. But these are the organizational strategies, the organizational objectives that will inform um, your marketing plan. And at Open Minds, we have a five-phase uh, marketing planning process that we use with our clients, um, that we uh, use ourselves. And the first phase is really focused on uh, the organizational strategy. Um, marketing, you know, developing the marketing objectives that, um, that come from your organizational strategy. And then um, the second phase is really about analyzing the market. So understanding your service lines, um, how are they working? What are the metrics that um, uh, in, in terms of um, the, the service line performance? What are our competitors doing? What's happening externally in the market? And then in phase three, um, we're really focused on the marketing strategy development. So based on what we know about the market and based on what we know about our enterprise, our organizational objectives, what are the strategies that we can put in place that are going to help us meet those objectives? Then we get into the actual marketing planning, which is focused on those tactics and developing a marketing budget that supports um, that plan. And then finally, you get into marketing plan implementation. 
this is the actual, this is the, um, the, the boots on the ground, the implementation planning, putting the timeline in place, the project management, um, and then of course the staffing for it. So we are not gonna get to touch on every single element of uh, the marketing plan uh, planning process today. We're gonna touch on a few of them, but as we get started and we're gonna start talking about uh, phase one and phase two, uh, it's time for some audience participation. So in your chat box, I would like you to, um, Uh, uh, take a look at these um, at, le at these examples of a marketing um, strategy, and I'm I'm so sorry. I'm having trouble with my window. It's cutting off half of my. <laughs> I can't see what I'm looking at. So I I apologize for the stops and starts as I'm speaking. But which of these is an example of a marketing objective? Is it number one, uh, increasing the traffic on your website from 1,000 visits per month to 2,500 visits per month through paid search? Would the objective be number two, uh, increasing and diversifying your revenue streams overall by expanding your Medicaid billing um, to 25% of your revenue and decreasing your federal and state grant revenue to less than 50% this fiscal year? Or would it be number three, developing a comprehensive integrated marketing plan to uh, grow your outpatient and telehealth ABA services? So just enter in the chat, chat, bot, or, uh, chat box whether you think number one, Number two or number three is the best example of a marketing objective. Do we have any entries yet, Sam? Hey, Emily, it looks like we have a couple of ones, a couple of threes, a lone okay. two. All right. Okay, well, that lone two is what we would consider as the best example of an overarching marketing objective. Um, and we're going to actually use that example a couple of times throughout the, the rest of this, um, uh, through the rest of the webinar. So all of these will end up at these could end up in your marketing plan. Um, we see number two as the overarching marketing objective. Um, in our in our view at Open Minds, number two or number three rather might be a strategy, and number one might be a tactic, depending on the different audience and the different um, objectives and strategies. Uh, all of these might have a place in your marketing plan but we would see the objective as something like number two. It's big, it's tied to an enterprise goal, um, it's, uh, it's a smart objective, uh, it is time bound, it has a specific um, measure to it, and um, it is tied to your uh, revenue objective. So for us, this is a very good example of a marketing objective that's aligned to your overall strategy. Some other examples. So this one is focused on revenue diversification and revenue streams. Um, but in some case, you might be um, your overall strategy might be around um, increasing um, the stability of your residential program. So in this case, your uh, your marketing objective is trying to get that average daily census to 250 and get your average daily rate uh, to around 225 in the next fiscal year. Again, it's smart, it's time bound, um, and it has specific measures and goals. Another objective might be um, around um, matching your market needs with, uh, with community-based services and expanding the prof profitable community-based programs that you have, again, smart, it's time bound and it's measurable. 
So as you start to pull together your marketing plan um, and your strategies, you're going to need some, uh, some information for, for your marketing planning. Um, so we set those, you saw in those objectives, you had specific goals and measures, but you internally and externally, you are going to have to understand how you're stacking up and what the what the market looks like so we would suggest that you have a, a couple of areas where you need to uh, to do some pretty significant market research as part of your um, as part of your planning process so you're going to have internal uh, intelligence and analysis and external intelligence and analysis and we can spend an entire session just on the market analysis um, and we, we can't do that, but uh, you should be looking at your service lines. You should be looking at your unique selling uh, proposition, your positioning statements, your current pricing model. Um, you should be looking at your competitors. You should be looking at the RFPs and the competition for contracts uh, that are in the marketplace. Externally, you're looking at the macro environmental landscape. What are the regulations that are um, driving your market? Um, who's the new competition? Who's consolidating? What are the different markets? Uh, what's the market size and the characteristics? The great news is, as elite members um, of Open Minds, you have a lot of this information right at your fingertips. Um, and uh, we, we're happy to, to help you find this information as you engage in your marketing planning process. But this is the kind of information you are going to want to gather up. Um, to make sure that you're ready to move forward in the rest of your marketing planning. Um, one of the steps is going to be really classifying your market and your potential customers. So a, an extremely important part of this process, if we go back to what Peter Drucker was saying, is that you need to know your audience. You need to know who you're talking to. You need to know who you're, um, who you're selling to. Um, and at, at any point in time, any one of these stakeholder groups could be um, the audience for a, a marketing strategy or a marketing tactic. Um, so, uh, you know, it might be your local community stakeholders. It's certainly going to be health plans, your different referral sources um, within your network, other specialty treatment providers, your large donors, your small donors. Um, these might all be uh, part of your marketing plan. And then your next step after really doing that mapping and understanding who, who your customers and who your stakeholders are, but then deciding who's important. If you go back to those strategies and you're looking at, uh, at revenue diversification, um, you're going to realize that, that your referral sources or your, your Medicaid health plans, um, your MCOs, um, and the consumers that you're targeting as part of that strategy, they're the most important part of your, um, your strategic plan for the next, next year. And so you should develop your marketing plan accordingly. Um, you don't want to spend too much of your emphasis on your um, PR strategy and your media strategy uh, if, if where you really need to focus your attention is on your health plans and, um, and the different referral sources. And you should never, ever, ever forget your own employees um, and your prospective employees. No matter what your marketing plan looks like, they, are, they will be and have to be a very important part of it. They're your ambassadors, they're your word of mouth, um, and they're the people that are doing the work. So make sure that in any marketing plan, your employees are part of it. So then we, so we have our objectives. We've, we've started to do our market analysis. We're understanding the trends that are shaping, um, shaping it. Uh, we're, we're understanding our, uh, our data internally and externally. We have our objectives and now it's time to move on to um, developing the marketing strategy. This is informed by the research that you've been doing, by the conversations that you're having internally with your leadership team, with your staff, um, and externally with your community stakeholders. What do they need? What do they value, then you can shape your marketing strategy based on that. So in this example, in our diversification objective, we identified that our key audience is going to be payers, um, specifically Medicaid MCOs. We said our objective was to increase and diversify revenue by expanding our Medicaid billing to 25%. So we know um, that our stakeholders in that, uh, in that objective are the Medicaid MCOs, and it's the Medicaid consumers that we have to start marketing to. So now we build strategies that reflect that. 
So in this case, it's developing more contracts with Medicaid managed care plans for current services. Um, we're conducting some market research and feasibility analysis um, of perhaps offering a case rate based program to Medicaid managed care plans and perhaps increasing our consumer marketing. This would have been informed by the research that, that we've done. Um, so we would know what current services we offer that would be really attractive to those managed care plans because we've done an internal service analysis. We would know that case rate um, case rate is uh, valued by our uh, Medicaid managed care plans because we would have had some conversations with them at this point um, to understand uh, what would be attractive to them. And then uh, I was going to say finally, but it's not really finally. The next step, of course, is develop the tactics. So you have your objective. We know where we want to go. We know the strategies that are going to get there. This is our roadmap. Um, in this case, we would then need to go a little bit deeper and understand what tactics can we build that will um, meet that strategy. So in this case, we might want to develop a specific marketing collateral that's customized toward the Medicaid managed care. Um, do we have the right kind of presentation um, that will demonstrate our program effectiveness to them? Do we have web pages that are tailored um, to their, uh, to the way that we want to communicate with that specific audiences? Um, do we need to create um, some web pages and make sure that that is the URL that we're using in our brochures and on our presentations? Um, so those are the things that you might want to think about. That would be a tactic. Um, have we, do we really understand who our target um, uh, MCO list is and have we found a contact at each one of those organizations that we can connect with? Could we conduct uh, email and phone outreach to those organizations to set up an introductory meeting so that they can meet us and understand our programs and services as we get into those different contracting phases? So these are some tactics that support this marketing strategy. And this is a little bit of the chicken or the egg. Um, so I put this slide after I talked about tactics, but you would actually um, start thinking about uh, the tactics based on the, the budget and investment. So what we often get asked at Open Minds as we're doing consulting on, on marketing programs is, well, how much do we need to spend on marketing? Like everybody wants to know a percentage, like what's the percentage of revenue we should be spending on marketing? Is it is it 5%, is it 8%, is it 10%? And nobody ever likes our answer, but it is always the same. You spend as much as you need to achieve your objectives but no more. So you start with the end in mind. What's the revenue number that you are trying to achieve um, as part of your overall strategy? And then you build the tactics that you need to achieve that revenue number. And you spend the money that you need to, uh, to, to achieve those tactics. So in the, uh, in the plan that we just showed, if I go back, the tactics that we have to um, accomplish here to reach the strategy, we need to invest some money in developing marketing uh, collateral. We might need to do a little bit of web development. Um, we're going to have to put some time into uh, making these um, these contacts and, and outreach to, um, to these health plans. Um, so we might need a person to do that. Do you have the, and this is where you start to get into the conversation around staffing, which needs to be part of your budget. Do we have the right person on staff that can do these things? Is this something that we need to outsource? Um, and this is not a sales, a sales pitch on uh, for, for open minds, but some of these things might be the things that, that you would outsource to, uh, to a firm. Um, you know, when I was on the other side of the table as a, as a, as a client, um, I was the director of marketing for a large health system and we had to do a tremendous amount of media buying. And that's just not my area of expertise. I'm actually, I'm really terrible at it and I hate it. I mean, there's nothing I hate more than dealing with TV schedules and, um, and, and newspaper advertising schedules. And I got permission um, to, to, outsource that to a local firm that was really, really good at it. Um, they were much more experienced. They had to con the contacts to do it. Um, and my time was better spent um, working on the other elements of the strategy uh, where I had the real expertise. So those are some of the things that you want to think about whenever you start to get into this budgeting question is, what are the things that we need to insource? How do we make the time for it? What are the things that we can, uh, that we can outsource um, to, to a firm? 
Um, and your budget should start with that revenue forecasting. So you're really going to be comparing your marketing expenses to the estimate of the revenue by the service line. Um, the marketing objectives are coming from the strategic plan. The strategies are coming from the strategic plan. And then um, that those tactics uh, will all be driven by the strategic plan. And you should think about at a line item level, what is the staffing that I'm going to need? What are the direct costs for this? And that's how you build the marketing budget. It's not based on a percentage of revenue. It's based on the tactics and the strategy. And then you're going to want to know whether your marketing plan is on track. Um, these are some metrics that I know that we look at at Open Minds. Um, this, is a, this is a little bit of an eye, uh, an eye chart that we won't go through in, in depth. But um, you sh as you're putting together your marketing plan, you should be thinking about how am I going to measure whether this is effective? Are we getting a return on this in investment? And these are some examples of metrics that can use your, your customer acquisition costs. Um, the ratio of your customer lifetime value um, to that customer acquisition cost, the time that it takes pay, to pay back that, that consumer acquisition, um, the percent of marketing that, uh, the percent of your referrals that were sourced by marketing or influenced by marketing, and we've given you some benchmarks here as well. And then this is the final slide, and then John and I can talk uh, a little bit more. Keys, uh, it, identifying marketing problems. So as you go through this whole planning process, um, you want to make sure that, um, that your marketing plan is successful. So these are eight things that we see um, diagnostically when things are going wrong in a marketing plan um, that you should take a look at. So number one on the list for a reason is to deal with the organization issues. Um, so even a really terrific product that as a, at the right price is going to uh, not perform well if you have chaos and a lack of accountability with your organization. Um, if nobody is accountable, then nothing, uh, then nothing gets done. So make sure that it's very clear in your organization who's accountable for rev revenue production, and then make sure that they have the authority uh, and, and the resources to do their job effectively. You want to look at the six P's of marketing. So it used to be four P's, but we added two P's, which would be public relations and your politics, but your product, your price, your place, your distribution, um, and, the, and the promotion. Make sure that you're looking at each of those. Um, and make sure that you're doing that market research in the planning phase. Um, make sure that you have the quantitative data and the qualitative data um, that are informing your marketing strategy uh, from uh, from the beginning. Uh, so make sure you don't don't operate in a silo. Make sure that you are um, looking at the market and also having the conversations with your key stakeholder groups. Um, I won't go through each of these, but just you know make sure that um, uh, that you know you're you're looking at your process and your planning and your review. And if something is is broken. Um, make sure that you're taking the time to fix it. Um, don't uh, don't sweep things under the rug. Don't uh, hope that the problem will solve itself. Go ahead and dig in. And then I always like to include this slide because I am a football fan, um, and I just I love this visual. Um, so strategy and marketing can't be implemented separately. You just you can't do it. Um, and when done correctly, your marketing should be a tool. Um, that's really used to implement the organization's strategic goal because everybody is going for a win. Um, when you win at your marketing, your consumers win in terms of the, um, the services that you're able to offer and the sustain sustainability of your organization. Um, and we want everybody to achieve those those win-win goals. So that is the end of the data piece. And now um, John and I can uh, well, I got a question. Kind of have a chat. Yeah. What's your favorite? Who's your favorite pro football team? Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, of course it's the Steelers. I'm uh, okay. I'm a Western <laughs> I'm a Western Pennsylvania girl. Um, if you're joining from Eastern Pennsylvania or anywhere else, you might not like that answer very much. But <laughs> but I am I I bleed black and gold. So. <laughs> Well, there's some um, folks in Gettysburg who, uh, I'm digressing, who are Ravens fans. Okay, so anyway. Well, that, that interesting. 
I didn't yes. know that. <laughs> um, so John, you know, you have a you have a, a terrific um, you have a terrific terrific background, um, and I you know I love to pick your brain anyway. But I was <laughs> something that I've that I've been thinking about. I wanted to pose the question to you when you're an example of, of when you're not meeting expectations and you need to rethink your target audience, because I, I've, um, you know, I, I can see in our, um, in our own consulting practice where people have felt like their target audience was X and it actually turned out to be Y. Um, what are your, what are your thoughts on, um, on targeting? Well, I think, first of all, marketing is you're always recalibrating based on more information. But so I headed up the New Jersey anti-tobacco program um, and we had two initiatives. Uh, we had we had a prevention targeting teens and cessation targeting smokers trying to get them to quit. And we had two programs called Quit Net and Quit Line to support smokers to quit. And we knew if we could get them enrolled, we could increase uh, success rates, or I should say, help them quit from 25 to 75 percent. And you know, when I came onto the business, I was pretty disappointed with the results. We had like 20,000 folks enrolled, um, and we were focusing on smokers overall, and arguably, kind of almost sh not sh kind of shaming them, and in the sense that. Um, we were talking about the facts of how harmful it was. And, and we decided let's pivot. And, and we, we, we felt like we could increase and lift uh, cessation rates from 25 to 75% if we could get them enrolled in the, into quit net or quit line. So we pivoted from smokers overall to smokers who have basically raised their hand uh, and wanted, wanted to get help. And we launched a We're There For You campaign. And you, you never know what the results are going to be, but I think we kind of nailed it. And we went from 20,000 to enrolling 100,000 folks in the cessation programs. So I think it's about nailing the target, nailing the positioning, pivot when you need to. And marketing, we always are pivoting based on, and also shaming. <laughs> is is not a good way to spark behavior change. So we wanted to be more aspirational and supportive. Right. I think it, it, it's a really good, uh, that's a really good message and, and a, a great example. And, and when I think, uh, one of the key things that I see organizations where they're making a mistake um, is because they're focused on their, um, they're focused on them instead of, their stakeholder or the consumer that they're trying to reach. We saw this in in um, in acute care in the hospital a lot because um, you know we have service line leaders that really want to promote really wanted to promote a new technology that they were offering or um, a, a new uh, a new provider uh, that was in the market because that's really important and you want to make the the new providers look uh, feel really good about what they're doing and you want to you know promote the investments in technology that you're making but your consumers um, you just need to make sure that the message and the positioning is consumer focused so it's not about the provider it's not about the technology it's about the consumer and how uh, and how that provider how that technology is going to uh, make their life better um, so make that that positioning is everything and knowing the audience um, it, it is it's everything so how about you Emily I've got a I was thinking about it as we're kind of going through this your presentation is um, I think what is one of the mistakes you see organizations make when developing a marketing plan you know what we talked about is a big one. Um, the I I think I see a couple I see a couple of things. Having the wrong positioning or not being um, consumer centric in your messaging or stakeholder centric because sometimes uh, sometimes your audience is is the payer of the health plan. So I think not knowing your audience or not speaking to your audience um, in a way that is really tailored to them. Trying to do this one size fits all. Um, 
messaging is a, is a mistake. Um, and I think I also see um, just, I see a lot of marketing plans that aren't marketing plans, they're promotion plans, um, or, uh, or they're a tactical plan, but they don't align to the objectives of, of the business. And you see, and I think that it, that becomes a symptom of marketing not having a seat at the table um, whenever it comes to um, planning for an organization. So I think, I think the initial mistake is not getting your marketing team engaged in strategic planning and bringing them in after the fact and saying, hey, here's our strategic plan. Um, and now we want you to put together a promotional plan for that. That's not the way it should work. Your marketing team should be very much a part of um, a part of that process. And probably some people on the line <laughs> are saying, "What marketing team? <laughs> we don't have a we don't have a marketing team. Um, it, I'm the marketing team, and I was sort of like voluntold uh, to to do this." Um, but, you know, I, I see that happen uh, quite a bit within organizations as well, where um, because they don't have a marketing strategy, they don't have a, a, a team or people who are signed and accountable for marketing. Um, and it's just, you know, we, the people on this phone and, and, you know, we at Open Minds are advocates and champions for making sure that you're resourcing that marketing, uh, that marketing team because they're not your promotion team. They're not your PR team. They are there to drive revenue. That is that is what they're there for. Right. Questions from the audience. Yeah, do we have any questions from the audience, Sam? Right. Sam is either very I'm quiet. Sorry about that. That's I okay. don't like myself from you. I did not. Um, <laughs> So let's see. Okay, um, we have a question here. It's how have you used data in building your marketing plan? We're talking about, you know, it comes down to driving revenue. Like, where does data come into play, and like, where do you, what are you looking for, and how do you get it? I can maybe try to tackle that one, um, and it kind of relates. So I, um, I, I was at. Meridian Behavioral Health, and I was kind of challenged with building a, a kind of a data-driven um, marketing uh, function, if you will. And there, you know, somebody asked, so "What are who are our customers?" And we kind of we we didn't really consistently track it in the EHR. So that was the first thing. What we needed to do is um, get you know trained to input. The data into the EHR, and 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 so we were challenged to you know track uh, the, the 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 referrals in the EHR upon admission, and then we just became more data driven and informed around our marketing plans, and we were able to take our census from roughly 75 to close to 95 percent, um, just by using data to inform our marketing plans and outreach. I think, um, I mean, there's, there's so many ways to use data in your marketing um, planning and, and, and you have to do it. So it's, it's your internal data, um, you know, that the, the data that you're getting from your EHR, your dashboard that you're putting together, um, to, to measure your KPIs and really understand how your service lines are performing. And if you don't have that data internally, like that's the place where you need to start with your marketing plan and your strategic planning is like putting a plan together to get the data that you need um, to inform your, your marketing strategy. So if you don't have the tools or the resources or the capacity and the, the infrastructure internally to even measure your marketing performance, that has to be one of your tactics or it has to be a strategy. And you need to put the plan in place in order to, to gather that data. Um, and again, I can't, I can't talk enough about the, um, about the resources that are available to you just through our, um, the, our data, um, 
that we provide at Open, Open Minds in terms of the market intelligence. So make sure, if you haven't yet, make sure that you're accessing the profiles for your state um, that, um, that cover the market that you serve. Make sure that you're looking at the organization profiles. You can go into our databases and you can sort, um, you, you know, to look at your own competitive set, you can sort by, um, by revenue and then take a look at those competitors. We might even have organizational profiles already developed. Um, you know, you're gonna look like a rock star whenever you go in and present to your leadership team um, just based on uh, uh, the, the profiles and the market research that um, that we're offering to you there. So don't, um, please do not hesitate to use our data. And if you're not sure if we have it for where it's at, um, reach out to uh, reach out to the Open Minds team, and uh, we can point you towards it. John, maybe uh, one last question for you. Um, When you're developing a marketing plan, um, we hear about the term relevance a lot in marketing. How does the word relevance impact your thinking and your planning um, in marketing? Uh, yeah, so I, I think, you know, I was at, uh, at Capella University and it's an online university headquartered in, in Minneapolis and I was, essentially hired to kind of help turn around their B2B efforts. So a lot of their business came from corporations who have tuition reimbursement, right? And so uh, we're selling, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm tasked with, we want to increase our, our non-degree business, if you will, um, tapping into tuition reimbursement. And after growing over 100%, um, it was declining uh, at 25%. And, and I think as we kind of dug into it, uh, the HR function was becoming a more strategic role. And, you know, so it was us having to understand and market to the chief learning officer. Um, and what, what we really needed to do is demonstrate, um, credit, build credibility and demonstrate value of our non-degree programs um, and and so what we ended up doing was we developed a white paper uh, as it spoke to the ROI because we, we tracked ROI of the mini MBA program leveraging data from uh, it's called knowledge advisors and we knew um, that it, it showed an ROI of 4.65 to 1. We also developed uh, a mini uh, cohort program with Daimler Chrysler. And then we also partnered with uh, CLO Academy. We were the academic arm of that, um, it, it, of that, uh, that, that, that initiative to really help build relevance within the CLO community. So I think we had, we pivoted from, it was a fairly, you know, the, the non-degree was, was really becoming more relational and relevant to the needs of the CLO. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah, that's um, it's it, it's a great example. Um, and, and I just and I, and, I, and I should say the results ultimately um, it increased from it went from negative twenty five to plus twenty eight percent year over year. Yeah. So again, it's about to your point, be relevant to the needs of your consumer. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's nothing constant but change. Um, and if your if your programs are are static, um, it they are not evolving uh, with the needs of the consumers that you have. And I I I, I think it really is about um, you know staying relevant. I feel like you have to stay on top of the pulse of what is happening with those consumers and make sure that you're out there talking, getting feedback. Um, from them in terms of, uh, of of what's working for them and and what's not. Right. So. What are those insights? What are the needs? Yeah. So, question for you, Miss Corns. Um, what makes marketing and health and uh, human services different from other industries? It's a it's a that's a great question. So. Um, 
I've worked in a couple of different industries. I mean, I shared my my truck body uh, industry experience with you, which is a fascinating industry, by the way. Um, I also have experience in um, in food and beverage and 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 CPG. Um, but my I, I think the difference that I've seen in health and human services is a little bit of what I alluded to before. I feel like marketing in health and human services becomes is is an afterthought instead of at the forefront. And usually the marketing function is someone who is being voluntold um, to handle marketing and to leadership marketing means promotion. Um, and I think at a I think be because of the way that careers involve in in health and human services, like you very often, uh, you know, you're starting out as a clinician. I did as a as a dietitian um, working in in public health. You know, I started out as a, as a clinician, and we got a big grant, and they said, okay, now you're responsible. You're the grant program manager, and you're responsible for marketing this new program and services that we're offering. So you know, you're. 23 year old dietitian and all of a sudden you have to become a, a, a marketing expert. And I think you see this a lot in health and human services. So I think the people who are doing the marketing aren't necessarily trained to do marketing and probably um, come in with a different perspective of what marketing um, is. And so I think that's the purpose of, of education like this is to uh, take people back to the enterprise organizational objectives um, and, and talk about how to do marketing planning. Um, but also, um, you know, I, I, I think that the values and what consumers value in health and human services is also very different than what they value. You know, finding the right substance use disorder treatment facility is very different than a car purchase. Um, the values and the motivators are very different. The funding streams are very different. And so it's important as marketers that we understand all of those nuances, that we, we understand how the money flows and how the funding flows. And then we're making sure that we're targeting the marketing to the right stakeholder group. Um, and I think it's more important to do that in health and human services than any other industry. Right. Sam, any questions from the audience? Hey, yeah, here's uh, one more question. Uh, so we talked about some examples of things that, uh, mistakes that sometimes organizations can make and the uniqueness of uh, health and human services marketing. Can you think of any examples of organizations that are doing this exceptionally well right now and kind of what are some of the things that they're doing to be excellent? That's a great question. So I see, I mean, I see a lot of our clients doing incredible work. <laughs> so, um, you know, I just think in terms of, um, I, if I think of some great examples of organizations who are making the pivot and the and the shifts that they need to make in terms of um, of really reaching out to their audience. You know, I think of um, I think of a case study that we have on our website right now around around hillsides. Um, they really needed to. Um, they were thinking about how how to diversify their revenue streams. Um, they were thinking about how can I uh, how could they reach out to the health plans to really connect with them and show them the programs and and services that they were offering um, so that they could have uh, more more mutually beneficial um, contracts. So sharing with the health plans what made Hillside special about the outcomes um, and and services that they were offering that were really different and unique than others uh, other providers. Um, so I think that they did a really nice job of uh, of making that pivot and starting to communicate directly to the health plans um, in a way that spoke to them while still 
having a, a public face to their consumers and to uh, and to their donors. So they're using very tailored and positioned um, messaging. So I, I think that they're doing a good job. I don't know, John, if you have any other providers um, that you're looking at. Um, you know, I, I think it's just, uh, it, it, it's interesting. We were just in a, we, we were speaking with the client uh, and the client will be named be nameless, but it's, it's really, it's getting from kind of the, re I mean, now I'm talking marketing, but it's, it's speaking to the higher order benefits, not kind of the rational. So it's getting, so what is, because a lot of times in my previous life, it's what's, you know, what's the reason to believe isn't the benefit. And so it's really getting after ultimately what's that higher order benefit that you're, you're really, that appeals to the customer. It's not, it's like, you know, it's like dishwasher So it's not about cleaning. It's, there's a higher order benefit that you need to appeal to. Right. I don't know if that answers a question or not, but. Yeah, and I, I think you can break it down by the different elements of marketing as well. I mean, we have some, uh, I've seen provider organizations that just have terrific branding strategies that are out there. They have, you have some that have really terrific donor outreach strategies. Um, and I, you see a lot of people that are doing a really good job in a certain part of their marketing, and I'm sure that they're doing uh, marketing planning to say this is this is the market that um, that we're going after. Um, so we need to increase our donor funding by seven to eight hundred thousand dollars this year, and you put all of your effort into that uh, into that donor strategy. So um, it really depends on uh, on what the what the target is, and I think there's a lot of people who are doing certain things really well. You know, just well, kind of related to that, I was going to say is, so I, I we, you know, one of my, I, I worked at an ad agency where we were launching um, what we'd call direct to consumer campaigns for drug company. We, Merck was a client and, and it was an interesting, and they wanted to be more consumer driven and focused. And, and so we, I, I worked on Fosamax, which, ultimately helps uh, women with, with osteoporosis, so prevents fractures. And so, but it, so it wasn't about, you know, it was getting not from, preventing fractures really wasn't, it was a sense of freedom and empowerment. And so that was just from the perspective of what is again that benefit, that higher order benefit that it's ultimately, it's an emotional benefit that's going to appeal to folks. Yeah, I think, I think as much as possible that provider organizations can take from um, consumer marketing, they should, because those strategies really work. I think that consumer marketing, like pharmaceutical companies, food and beverage, do a terrific job of really understanding that value proposition. Um, for for the audience so you know those those messaging like you're working for in the agency for um for the medication that messaging and really really getting to the core of what is going to motivate them to either make a change or choose uh choose your service um is is key and getting that positioning really right um, and it's worth investing your time uh, into doing that uh, and really putting a plan in place Sam, if there aren't any other questions, um, we could, um, sh shall, we, shall we wrap up, John? Any closing thoughts on marketing planning for competitive advantage and developing new business? <laughs> um, you know, it, I've got a question maybe for you, Emily. You know, what advice would you give to providers about tactics they select for their marketing plan? Um, I, you know, I think it, the, the tactic that you select has to, um, has to address the, the strategy that you're trying to achieve. So, um, if, if it's about 
donors. Um, so if if you have that if you have an objective of increasing your um, your large uh, donors, your strategy and your tactics need to map that. So that means that you need to have the internal resources in place that will do business development for your large donors. And you have the so it's about staffing. It's about finding the right person. Um, that can do that kind of outreach because it is not easy to do. Um, finding your um, your donor relations or your business development or your um, you know fund development uh, person within your within your organization it's a it's a key role um, and they have to we we know the 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 types of um, uh, characteristics they need to have in terms of building rapport. Um, and and asking for uh, asking for for money. So make sure that you have the right people in place, that you have a staffing plan, and that your tactics and re the that the resources and are there um, to make the tactics work. So you can't just do the strategy and say we are going to to do this. You have to make sure that the resources are in place. Um, so I think just making sure that that cascade is is working really well. Okay, perfect. Yeah, uh, I think if that wraps us up, Emily, I have a couple of promotional slides at the end here, if you wouldn't All mind. Right. Yep, absolutely. Okay, yep, please consider joining us next week here. We're going to have uh, Open Minds, Joe Naughton Travers, and he's going to be talking about uh, launching blended service lines, and so you don't want to miss that. That'll be available uh, to register at openminds.com, go to the events tab, and it's listed as an executive web form. And one more slide, please, Emily. And uh, consider joining us next month in sunny Southern California, August 23rd through 27th. We're going to have our Management Best Practice Institute. There will be all of these uh, wonderful sessions and more. So feel free to check it out and register at management.openminds.com. I want to thank Emily and John again today for putting on this wonderful session. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Bye -bye. Thank you. Yeah, Bye. at Management Best Practices Institute, we are also offering the marketing seminar. Um, so hope you'll join us for that. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you.